Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Raw Men, and this, I think, is episode number 62, the ones that I'm bothering to count anyway, uh, and today I'm kind of stoked because I'm talking to somebody that, although he appears to be younger than me, uh, he's actually one of the first uh, atheist activists on radio, and he was, he was one of the activists who actually inspired me to become an activist myself, uh, and while his family may know him as Reginald Finlay, I have I know him better as the infidel guy. Uh, pleased to have you with us, sir. Well, thank you very much for having me. I, I I'm I'm flattered. <laughs> well, thanks for the introduction. Well, I want to hear I want to hear your story. I want to hear how did you get so what what prompted you to do a radio show? What was your motivation and how did you go about putting that together? You know, it was quite odd, really, because. Um, uh, I started, I went to school, uh, I started college at St. Leo College, which was a Catholic uh, university, so to speak, I guess. Um, uh, I was straight out of the military, so this was like a long distance uh, college. And I began to take a lot of courses in, in philosophy and uh, Old Testament wisdom because it is a Catholic school, right? So I took courses in Old Testament wisdom, I took courses in New Testament wisdom, and I found that completely boring, but yet at the same time, there were some aspects. I just I discovered that there were a lot of things that I just did not know. I thought, I don't know what I thought. You know what I mean? You, you, you're, I'm a, I was a Christian at the time. I thought I knew everything. I, I don't know if that goes with the territory. I, I don't know, but <laughs> I thought I just knew everything, right? And so I thought the Bible just descended from heaven or something, and I, I didn't know that there were all these different variations of the uh, and of the Bible and all these different things, but uh, after that, the dean of the college approached me one day. He says, "You know what, you know, Reginald, you're doing really well in your uh, philosophy courses um, and theology courses, I should say. Why don't you take this philosophy course called atheism?" <laughs> so, like, why would I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was, was like, are you kidding me? I'm a, well, uh, well, but then I said, "Well, you know what? I, I really don't know their position, so let me go ahead and hear what they have to say." And the textbook was Atheism, the Case Against God. I read the book three times before the course started. That's how much it affected me. And I realized that George had the courage to say and think what I think I suppressed because I felt comfortable, I think, in my ignorance, I guess. There was kind of an, an arrogance that I felt one with God or close with God, so I didn't need to know anything else, I guess. Even though I did have this curiosity, this deep down scientific curiosity, always there was just still this air that I knew what I needed to know theologically and philosophically that was just there. But it turned out not to be true. Long story short, I took the course, um, I excelled in it. Later on, the professor admitted to me slash dean that uh, he was an atheist too. Because I became an atheist after the course. By the end of the course, I realized I was an atheist, I should say. Uh, in some ways, I think I might have always been one. And so it, and it wasn't until, uh, and like I said, and, and I, I conceded that and immediately, and this is about, you talking 1997, 1998, and I think it was, about, it was around 1998, I started looking online for other uh, people who thought like me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I only kept bumping into European, European white males uh, most of the time uh, back then, uh, or, but I didn't find any black people at all. So it took about another year or so, and I discovered Norm Allen Jr. with, uh, at the time, he was with Americans, um, African Americans for Humanism. And I said, whoa, there is another black guy out there who doubts or who doesn't believe. And I began searching more and more. And long story short, I discovered uh, the Atheism Freedom Liberation Show, which was, uh, his name is uh, Jake, at least that's the name, name he went by at the time. And law, we, we started, uh, I learned from him uh, how to do the program. And because I asked him, how do you do this? And because he wasn't doing it as often as I'd like, I wanted to show like every you know week. And some weeks he would skip a show. And so I asked him, how do you do this? And he said, he taught me how to do it. And we later teamed up and formed the Atheist Network. Uh, we formed Free Thought Media. Um, we had a Free Thought Radio going on for a while. So we had a lot of different programs we created and we had a whole network full of people at one point. And many of those podcasters broke off and started and created their own shows after that, one of which is Doc Bob Price, the Bible geek. So you're connected with, with Bob Price's start as well? 
Oh, yes, yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, his show spin. He was his show was really a spinoff uh, of my program. Wow. Like, okay. So, so what's funny about that is that back at that time, uh, I was I was just realizing that I was an atheist also. Although it turned out that I was an atheist for fifteen years and didn't know it. Right. <laughs> I, I bought I bought the lie. You know that there's a there's a great negative marketing campaign that the religious communities have done to say that you can't be an atheist unless you know everything, right? Because you have to you have to know for certain that there is no God before you can say atheist. Otherwise, you can only say agnostic. And right. then I remember Carl Sagan saying that, you know, that an atheist is someone who knows there is no God. An atheist knows a lot more than I do. So they made it out that atheist is an unreasonable position and only agnostic is a reasonable position. But right. then when I figured out what, what atheism really means and that I'd been lied to this whole time, my first reaction was uh, I was I was both alarmed and humiliated uh, because I mean I'd always been told that atheists believe in nothing, right? Because they use a different word. They use belief different than we do. We do. So oh, yeah. like if, if you're not a believer, then the word belief is something you think is true but you don't know is true. But if you are a believer, then the way you define belief is more like that you will convince yourself that it's true, that you just <laughs> have to believe hard enough. So believe means make believe. So essentially pretend. So Indeed. believer kind of means pretender. Uh, In so many respects, it does. I, yeah. I, I agree. With, I agree with that. And it's interesting that just recently I was involved in a debate and, uh, in which uh, an individual wanted to, he wanted me to prove to him evolution, uh, you know, and we'll, and we'll get back to my past in a minute, but it just crossed my mind. This is so integral, I think, when we talk about this concept of belief and faith, and of course, as you know, there are uh, different, there are variances in belief and, and faith and what you know, what you think you know, your opinion, and all these things have different usage, uh, usages depending on what you're applying them to. And so this guy just kept saying, well, first of all, his, he said, I want to see an organism of one kind become another kind. And of course, I got into that and said, that's not a scientific term. And, and he started talking about Darwin. I said, you know what? That he, he's not the father of modern evolutionary biology. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to keep reminding him of all these things. But, but he said that you just can't accept the fact that you believe, just like I do, that your ideas are true. I have beliefs. They're the same. And I said, you know what? I'm not even going to waste time arguing with you about what belief is and what faith is and all these things. Tell you what, I'm going to give you that. Let's say it is a belief I have. Let's just say it. Let's just say that it's a belief. There are still differences. One major difference is I have evidence that supports my belief and you don't. So let's talk about the evidence. What is most likely true based on the preponderance of the evidence rather than you wanting to just hold on to this idea that I have faith or I believe in something. So what? Uh, dispute, the, dispute the evidence. Now, I don't do that with all people, but only him, because he just could not let that go. And I knew that he would listen to reason anyway. So I said, well, let me just meet him where he is. And there really was no logical retort to that after I said that, because that's the only thing he could hold on to. So I said, well, where's the evidence? There, there just, he just doesn't have any evidence for his position. That's, so, that's very often the case when I get into these discussions. The first thing they want to do is redefine what faith means. Right. So at some right. point, they will in, in eventually admit that faith is a belief that is not based on evidence. And that's what all the scriptures say, not just the Christian right. scriptures, but for every other religion, too. And all the dictionaries and all the practical usages for all the sermons of theologians, past and present. Everybody understands what this means. But you get Indeed. into an argument with an atheist and suddenly they have to reverse the definition. So the people will tell me that 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 faith is a belief that is based on evidence and that what I'm calling faith is blind faith. That's if there's a difference. In, indeed. In, indeed. In any respect, and that is kind of the separation that they really do have a blind faith. Uh, but of course, if, if you start going down that road, then you start arguing semantics and they start justifying their, it, it can get nasty. But, but, but there really is a difference, obviously, as you're pointing out, between you know what, what one believes to be true, what one has faith in, versus what one accepts based on the preponderance of the evidence, which is something that they just obviously, I mean, they don't have. So I, I choose, I, I prefer to say I accept based on evidence. Um, belief and faith is, is meaningless uh, you know, to me in that context. It makes more sense in a religious context. So you started out in this thing and you said that Bob Price's show was actually a spinoff yeah. of your show. Yep. 
Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's funny that at this time, the way that I was figuring out my own religious position was I was on Usenet, you know, talk.origins was where I was spending oh, a lot yeah. of time. And I found myself uh, talking with people that I would later meet in real life. I mean, there was a handful of, pe of, of names that I knew from Usenet, and then I would, I would meet them at conferences. You know, and these names included, you know, but not limited to, you know, PZ Myers and, and, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I, oh, my God. Uh, Richard Carrier and, yes. uh, and Bob Price, of course, and, and a number of others that, uh, that, that didn't become speakers themselves, but were names that I remembered arguing yeah, with. Jay you know. Louder and, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you spent a lot of time on, uh, Usenet as well and talked about Origins too, did you? Oh, yeah. Of course. Uh, Mark, okay. Mark, was it, was it Mark? Uh, 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 Valetic, Mark Valetic. Uh, John Hartman? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so. So it's funny that I don't remember your actual name. I know, right? I know. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and, and likewise, we had uh, to reveal to the audience that, that Reginald didn't know about me either until like very, very recently. Yeah, yeah pretty much. I'm, I think it was one of my friends, Michael uh, Tomlinson, uh, on Facebook. He said, it might have been a couple of years ago, he says, have you heard of this? Uh, at the time, I get I me. Mean, everybody thinks it's Aaron, right? Uh, yeah, you know, I heard it's Aaron, it's, it's Aaron Ra guy. I'm like, oh, no, I've never, you know, heard of this guy. Check out his videos, and and I went. My first thought was, has this guy been listening to my shows? No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> but I was really impressed though, and I thought, I said, wow, you know, this I, I like that, it, you know, and and I and I miss it, you know, and I started thinking about, wow, I miss this, but I, I got out of the game, so to speak, for a number of reasons, but. Uh, now, if you don't want to go into that, that's fine. But I mean, people are going to be curious about. Yeah, you, know, you had you had a bit of fame. I don't know if that equates to anything in in your reality, because uh, I mean, I, I don't feel famous in everyday life. You know, I, I I'm, right. I'm not like signing I mean, it, autographs it, at the it, grocery store. It, it went to my head once. It did go to my head once. I remember I, I made a few visits to Amherst, New York. I was touring all over the place at one point, speaking. I mean, all over the nation, uh, giving various talks on, on critical thinking. And, uh, and the philosophical justification for atheism, um, which was I felt really good at, uh, you know, at the time. And really, uh, I don't try to blame Yahoo for, I mean, not Yahoo, but uh, YouTube for all of this. But <laughs> right around 2004, 2005 is when the whole wife swap thing happened. For many people who may not know, I, I starred on ABC's wife swap and with my wife at the time, a first wife. and. Um, I didn't know anything about that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, don't, don't look it up. Don't look it up. All right. So, um, <laughs> but one of your listeners did and actually contacted me on Facebook and he said he apologized to me uh, because he gave me a hard time about some things that transpired on the show. And long story short, uh, I basically ended up crying. I, I just lost it emotionally uh, because I wanted, to assume, I wanted to assault the producers of the show. Um, but I had to control myself uh, because... You know, I'm, I'm representing atheists, I felt, you know, um, over the, not just the nation, but the world. So I, I tried, it, it just took so much power and energy to being calm on the program. And I, I wanted to snap on this guy. But anyway, uh, but there were a number of things going on. The White Swap episode created a, a schism. There was uh, just a divide between different groups. Who's, some groups were like, you, you made us look bad, you made us look great. And then others, and then YouTube came out and all this free content was available on YouTube. And so, and then I didn't have to, I think by then, I think I was just beat down and tired. And I, I began looking for a job in corporate America and almost every interview, you know, oh, you're the infidel guy, you're the infidel guy, you're the infidel guy. We can't hire you. We're worried about this coming back on us. We can't. And so I said, well, maybe I need to go back to school. And so I decided to go ahead and just close my business. I left infidel, infidelguy.com uh, up. It is still available. All the radio programs I did are about 500 of them. They're still available for download. Um, they're hosted by Google. Hopefully they'll be there indefinitely or until they start charging. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, so I left all that and I, I, I sold, uh, I had a website called atheistforums.com. At one point I had 17 different atheist based websites, blackatheist.com, blackfreethinkers.com. Infidel guy, infidel forum, atheist forum, and you name it. I had so many websites, and I just, I think I, I got burned out. And I said, let me just focus on getting my education so that I can make an, uh, an honest or make a steady wage 
and then get back maybe into it later. And what ended up happening was that just didn't happen. Well, it, I, 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 you're saying you're saying that just didn't happen. I mean, I went back to school too. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I felt very encouraged to uh, to get a degree of some kind because why did I know all of this information and I wasn't using it? However, for me, uh, right. you know, there was a number of things. Of, of real life kind of hit me in a number of different avenues all at once, and I, I ended up having to drop out again, which I was enormously frustrated at because this is late in life for me. Right. You know, and I don't have the accolades that you do. I think I even I, I I even failed a chemistry class at one point. It was so bad. But you you say that didn't happen for you. And I'm I, at a glance, I see you've got a bachelor in human development. You got a master of education in science. You've got a master of science in, in biology. Uh, you've got a Ph.D. I'm working on my Ph.D. right now in, in public health. Mm hmm. That's that's outstanding. You you're saying it didn't happen for you. <laughs> no, I mean I'm not getting any money. I tell you that much. I'm just a broke school teacher. Um, you know, but I mean I'm doing what I can do at this stage in my life right now. I want to do more. And again, uh, again, I, like I said, seeing you again uh, or seeing you it reminded me of many others that I saw come up over the years that I respected. And and, and I think your motivation and your drive reminds me of myself when I was really having that energy to do that. And like I said, I just kind of lost that. But uh, but I honestly, seeing your videos has kind of reinvigorated me and is motivating me to get back into it. And I've had listeners and friends and fans and for years telling me, get back into it, get back into it. But I just could not think, what do I want to do? Uh, everywhere I turn, there are some, as you know, there is so much wonderful content out there. And I began, so I, I started wondering, what can I do to add to this? There's so much out there. Um, but after speaking to my, again, my fans and then even parents who tell me that their kids have made complete changes academically, their interest in science has completely changed. They went from not caring to just loving it and to wanting to be scientists. And uh, many of my listeners contacted me through LinkedIn saying, hey, dude, your show, I got a PhD because of your show. And I had no degree <laughs> when, I, when I started. Didn't know anything. Thought I knew a lot. Um, you know, well, so was, we are we are talking about twenty years ago. I mean, you've managed to accomplish uh, yeah. a lot more in that time than I did. You know, I'm, yeah, it's been a while. It's been a long time. <laughs> wow. I mean, yeah. I mean, at the height of my program, um, according to the stats that I was looking at, I, mean, I had people. I had about one hundred thousand listeners from all over the world at one point. Uh, I was earning pretty good money at one point. I wasn't rich, but I was doing pretty well. I could take, I could pay all my bills, take care of my family. Uh, but like I said, when all these things happened, then my mom passed away, and ah, uh, it was just, it was just too much. I just, I just, I think I was depressed to be honest, and I just pushed a lot of things away that I felt were bogging me down. And and I said, okay, I need to prioritize, and my pr priority was my education. And I just, I couldn't deal with the stress of any, anything else, so I just kind of pushed everything else out of the way. Let me just find a simple job, pay the bills, go to school, and I'll come back later. And uh, I think now I'm. I'm getting, I'm at that point now where I am ready to come back and do some things. So. Well, I'm, I'm excited to hear that. And I want to, want to help promote you when you're, when you're able to do that. I understand you're, uh, you're planning on building a new studio, um, yeah. re, re equipping for your radio show and everything. Yes. Uh, all about that. I don't know what I can do to, to help you get that going, but. Uh, <laughs> you know. Well, I do have a donate button at infidelguy.com. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but really, I mean, if anyone's interested in seeing me come back, I promise you guys, I'm not going to stiff you. I'm, I'm coming back. Um, I, I am, re I've really developed an interest in uh, endogenous retroviruses as a really good argument, you know, against evolution. So, I mean, for evolution. So, I'm really into that. Um, uh, I'm kind of integrating my public health knowledge with um, with evolution in, in many respects and how we have these various genetic protections against certain diseases that evolved that way and we can track these uh, these changes uh, via our molecular uh, chemistry so I'm, I'm so I think I'm thinking about bringing some of that in, into the picture I want to focus more on critical thinking and science that pretty much is what I want my basis to be I'm not really interested in theology anymore in the past that's kind of what I was I don't know. I know you're thinking. We had a conversation about this, um, you know, <laughs> before. That infidel guy is my brand. Uh, agreed. That is my brand, um, and I think it really did help move me into an area where, you know, I, or it, it gave me this persona. It gave me this, 
it, it created me, so to speak. But I don't know. I think now I'm. I just kind of want to pull away from that because uh, I, I like the like the stupid things I'm seeing right now, for instance, in the media. It's not based. Some of the things I'm seeing aren't even based on religion. It's just based on lack of critical thinking. Um, yeah. Yeah. There and, is yeah. And so I, I and I think that if one becomes a, a, a critical thinker, if one becomes uh, more honest in their ability to act to know things then I think that they inevitably will begin to also critically analyze religion as well. Um, you just, it's kind of hard. We do it, we compartmentalize all the time, but if you are trained since birth, so to speak, to question your own thinking, how can you not question what everyone else throws at you? And so that's what I wish to do. I just, I just want to inculcate that more, talk about the value of that and how to go about doing that and, and also how to use Socratic method of argumentation and Socratic dialogue to help other people think more deeply as well and then, and then feed them science uh, at the same time. Now, what I'm most familiar with of your work is like where you know, primarily where you're interviewing people or, or I guess a better word would be, you know, discussions with other people right. that were here. Like I was just listening to the thing with you and Bart Ehrman, for example. Oh, that was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> that was why? bad. Why was it a nightmare? Well, well I'll, t I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, I mean, I mean, people who know me, they understand what I was trying to do with that radio show. They, they, they know. People who don't know me beat me up horribly. They're like, you know, he kicked your ass. You didn't know what you were doing. But I said, well, I mean, I was really trying to get Bart to come out of his shell and educate the audience. But what ended up happening, he's, he, he was kind of pushing back. And he didn't understand that I was giving him the reins. Of course, I was going to nudge him a little bit and challenge him and, and, t and criticize some things that he might be saying because these are things I've heard and I wanted to get his opinion, but instead, for he just kept of, back. For purposes of clarification, because you know where the criticisms are, right? Oh yeah, of course. I, I know what, I mean, I've, I've, I've listened to Richard Carrier, I've listened to others, um, um, Doc Bob Price, I've listened to some, some of these others, these scholars, and so I wanted to just kind of throw at him, I wanted him to debunk that if he could do it. I mean, I was, at that time, I was critical and skeptical of a, of a historical Jesus. Now I just don't really care, but I wanted him to actually come and you know say something. And I felt like he just kept pushing too much. Later on, about I think it was six months to a year later, someone who knew him came to me and they said that he apologizes about this. He thought he thought he didn't know you. He didn't know who the infidel guy was. He thought that you were trying to just find a wedge in to find a way to attack him, and so his guard was up. Um, but he said you know, yeah, so. I'm going to clarify that too, because I mean, it, this is a problem that I see way too often within the atheist community. That I mean, of course, outside that too, but it bothers me most when it happens within it. the The way that people uh, can be judgmental over any any disagreement, right? Right. And so, so Bob Price, who we've already mentioned, and Bart Ehrman were in a debate recently, wow. in the, uh, within a year ago, uh, about the you know historicity of Jesus. Right. And people will choose a side or a single disagreement to to dis either gentleman on, right? And I I just can't be that way. I mean, right. uh, Bob Price and I have very have very dramatic political difference uh, differences, as you know he does with a lot of people actually. Yes. Um, but um, I I respect Bob Price's uh, scholarship, nonetheless. You know, he and I can can face where we disagree on anything, and it doesn't matter beyond that topic, right? Likewise, with uh, with with uh, Ehrman, uh, I have identified as a mythicist. I've interviewed every mythicist there ever was, and um, I still have to concede that I went to a uh, I took a, a class, one of the best classes I ever took, by the way, uh, was a class in uh, the the history of world religions, and it was based. Uh, the, the PhD uh, instructor in this case, or the professor, uh, based the entire course on the books of Bart Ehrman. So, <laughs> Interesting. I mean, so I have to give respect, you know, to to the man. Now I can have differences of opinion on certain things, and I can label exactly what my reasoning is, and I can cite his counter argument and why I think it was weak. Indeed. But, right. but you don't judge the entirety of a person no. over any difference, really. And, and I, I see way too much of this kind of divisiveness going on. I, I agree. I see that as well. Um, you know, throwing out the baby with the, uh, with the bathwater, as they say, right? Um, you know, just one aspect alone, and you know, you, you know, you've already pretty much put them in one box. That's, 
And uh, that's one thing I've argued lately as well against people who would like to categorize people as liberals uh, or conservatives. I'm sure you've heard this a lot as well. Once you put someone in a particular box, they're easy to attack. And I said, this is an old technique. We've, we've done this with, humanity has done this with other groups or the others forever. Uh, with, with, with black people, right? They did the same thing with, with blacks. They weren't really human, they are like this. Uh, they did the same thing with many other um, organization, uh, uh, individuals uh, uh, in, Vietnam, in the Vietnam War, right? They depicted the, you know, the the VC as little yellow monkeys that you know just. This is what we do, and I think we're doing the same thing now with this whole liberal conservative thing. Once you tag someone, the conversation completely stops. There's you already have an idea of everything this person is about just from a label. So why are we gonna to continue to have a conversation? And I don't, and I can't stand that. I will say, well, I don't agree. I think Obama was right about so-and-so. Well, I think Trump is actually right about this. <gasps> and right away, you are categorized as, as you know, something that is the antithesis of what they think you should be. Yeah, well, no, nobody seems to understand nuance. And with, with Obama, for example, you, you bring him up. Uh, people don't understand that I can say that I liked Obama overall. Right. And not understand that I had, you know, 40% differences with him, and some of them are significant, right? Agreed. But, but when you when you measure all of the uh, all of the pros and cons, it comes out a net positive, and it's it's close to the middle, but it comes out a net positive overall, right? Even though I have big differences and and a oh, lot of sincere complaints with things that he did, that right. doesn't mean that I love Obama, right? <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. It, but people have to look at it that way. They have it has, it has to be an all or all or nothing, black or white, you know, love hate relationship. It, it, it is ridiculous. Yeah, uh, agreed. And this has led to a great deal of polarization in our country. Oh yes. Uh, on on every axis, it seems. Every axis. Yes, I tell my students all the time. You know, I'm, I'm a science teacher, but I can't help it. Uh, I try not to bring in politics much, but I I do when it affects uh, or when science is involved. Um, so I make sure they understand. I said we, we, we talk about this character who the um, you know who wants to who's going to lead the EPA, and I tell them uh, I told my students don't political Republican Democrat in between none of that matters. What you should really look at is what are is their particular position on okay. a particular issue and how can they affect uh, that outcome? Or, you know what, what is it that they're going to do uh, because of their beliefs or because of their position? then that's how you determine how you vote for someone, not because they belong to a particular party. I said, if you fall for that, they got you because that's what they want you to believe. And if everyone woke up and realized that that's what's happening, I think we'd make much better decisions and we'd be much better citizens and voters. But it's like, we just, we just feel tricked. You know, it's like, I, don't, I mean, I don't think they realize they're kind of tricked into this kind of On the issue two party system. I mean this is this is used against me all the time. I'm criticized for being left. I'm clear, criticized for being liberal, which is supposed to be a centrist position. Uh, <laughs> right. you know, so it, you know, so do you, am I both? Is it possible to be both? But everybody seems to be running with a different definition. And so if you use the label, true, you have to use what you mean by that label, or people think that you mean what they mean by that label. And very often you can't right. get them to look. When I say no. this. I mean this, right? And I can show that this is the mainstream meaning. So obviously, I mean this, and I don't mean the thing that you can't find me. You, you're using a definition you can't show me, <laughs> right? Right. So yeah. Why would I use your definition? So, so the, the thing is, you can't use the label at all. No, you can't. You just you can't. just use the definition, and 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 so you have to replace that, and you can in most cases. So, and, but even then, you, you, you get criticized. I mean, I said that you know I was about the people, and somebody says you can't be about the people because it's because everybody wants to claim that they're about the people, but the people are divided. Yeah, the people are divided, but you can be for the people, in, instead of for you know major corporations, instead of the one percent. You can right. be for the people. Like, you Agreed. can promote the right. middle class, for example, which is the right. big deal for my campaign. But we're not here to talk about me or my campaign. Um. I, I said I was aware of, uh, of of your interviews predominantly, uh, and I happened to bring that one up, which seemed to have touched a sore spot for you. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I only, only because of the flag. I, I still get flagged about it today. 
they'll get thinking about it today. All right. Well, do you have a, a, a favorite or a least favorite example? Because, I mean, I could name a couple of other people that you've talked to that, that were fun. Oh, my gosh. There's so many. It is so... Um, you know, even the ones you think I should hate, I really enjoy. Kent Hovind. Oh, I love him on the program. He's great. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you got the pre-convict Kent Hovind. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and you would think, I thought he would have learned something after being in prison for so long. Uh, but he comes out just saying the same old, same old. So like, did you learn in all those books they have in prison? You didn't learn anything. But um, but yeah, but he, but he, he was great. I mean, I mean, people, I got beat up about that. And uh, before, they said, why do you like him? You know, he's such a fraud and he, he hurts people through his lies. And I said, I don't mean to like him like, like I like, I don't know, my mom or dad or something, or, or, you know, or you. Uh, you know, I mean, there's, he's just charismatic. There is something about him that is interesting. And, it, and I almost want to see what train wreck is going to happen next. It's like watching a, a movie or something. Um, that you just know something horrible is going to happen in a moment. And you're just going to watch it to see it. You're like, I just love this show. It's stupid, but I just love it. It's, it's like um, back when we used to watch Jerry yeah. Springer. Right, right. We, we want to see who's going to get hit with a chair. <laughs> <laughs> In a way, yeah. So, I mean, so that's what I mean, you know. And so I haven't, uh, I think I only watched maybe two videos since he's been out. But you, know, you, you, you give that example, and it reminds me, it wasn't Jerry Springer that w did it for me. It was Geraldo Rivera. Oh, yes. I so hate Geraldo Rivera. What an <laughs> idiot. But it was funny to watch the show. I mean, because he he would do things like he he put Ozzy Osbourne on one show, right, and 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 called him out saying, "Don't you feel responsible when people kill themselves listening to your music?" And and Ozzy's like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you talking I about?" Know, so, right? so, so like, Ozzy's do you like beating your wife. Yeah. But yeah. It, the, my favorite episode of that was when you know, it, and the, the reason that I watched the show, I would I would I would occasionally watch just because I need to get angry at something, right? But the, my, the, the most gratifying show was when he had Charles Manson on. And I thought Manson just ate Geraldo. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Manson is so much smarter than Geraldo. You know, it's yes. not, not a big trick, obviously, but it right. but the, <laughs> it was a brilliant thing to see on TV. It was. Oh, indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Yeah, so that was so that was probably that's one of the most memorable memorable because he's he's been on multiple times on the program, and uh, let's see, and, and I consider it, I don't know, I think, I think he's in his own category, but I really enjoyed my programs with Dr. Massimo Pigliucci. Uh, he was on quite a bit, um, and he is the individual that was that's responsible for me really getting into my passion for biological evolution. Um, and I discovered him, I think, before I even discovered Richard Dawkins. So, really, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious about you know when you said you wanted to focus on your education. I mean, you so you started out, you started out taking a course. Let's remember, you were taking a course in Old Testament wisdom. Old Testament wisdom, indeed. It, yeah. That just sounds like a contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that much later. <laughs> and then you go from that. To, I mean, a master of education in science, to a master of science in biology, and now you're, and, and now you're changing, or, or now, you're, yeah. now you're chasing a, a PhD. Outstanding. So, well, thank you. I got that. I guess um, I have some <laughs> of my PhD friends are like, "Don't do it! Don't do it!" Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting how the transition occurred. I, I, I earned my first bachelor's because I considered I just wanted to teach originally. So that was kind of a ground level kind of degree that I could probably branch out in different areas, just take a test and teach. It didn't matter what I taught. But after I took that, I just wasn't satisfied after I got that, after I earned that degree. And I said, well, I want something that shows more a higher level of something that I love to do, which is science communication. So I earned my master's of education in uh, science in the public, which is a science communication uh, degree. And after that, I still wasn't satisfied because I went, yeah, but I'm, I'm now debating with, with my new science, science communication prowess. I'm now deba debating people about evolution and they're coming back with, yeah, but what's your background? What is your degree in? How do you know this information? And I said, well, tell you what, let me go ahead and get my master's in biology. Maybe that'll shut them up. <laughs> and then I realized I still can't get a good paying job. Maybe I should just write books and maybe I want to travel. So, I considered uh, a PhD in science communication, but then I later decided to go ahead and get my PhD in uh, public health because I considered uh, I, my master's, oh, 
um, one of my uh, research projects uh, for my first master's was looking at how um, the misunderstanding of science uh, is basically harming people, especially in the health in, in the healthcare field. So when, um, you, when you're talking about, especially in healthcare, I mean, you're reminding yeah. everybody, of course, this is the this is the age where we're now denying. Uh, we're right. denying medical coverage because we can pray the situation away. Exactly. We're, we're denying blood transfusions. We're denying vaccinations. You know, we're yeah, all that. Exactly. And so, um, so I, and I, well, it's a long story. I'm debating whether or not I want to say this or not, but uh, I just, I'll just condense it. Someone I know, someone, someone that I knew in my family um, died because the family delayed getting her proper medical treatment because two reasons. One is money, but the other was that uh, they wanted to, I guess, be healed by God or something. And so uh, I did research on this guy and this doctor, this naturalist, this nat naturopathist, whatever he's supposed to be, and discovered that he was about to lose his medical license. All of the testimonies couldn't be backed up. I called the company. They couldn't give me the name of anyone. I said, but you have all these testimonies and you have names next to them. Can you let these people know that I want to talk to them to confirm if this treatment works? No. Do you have any peer reviewed studies? No. So then why should anyone believe you? Click. So um, I try to warn my family about this and say, look, this is this guy's a scam. He's going to harm somebody. You need to get traditional uh, cancer uh, treatment. They did not. This person died um, in a horrible, horrible way. And that um, that motivated me to go ahead and I wanted to do research and see how 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 much um, impact that is happening um, on our community and in the nation and, and now I'm doing research globally um, but I think I'm going to focus just for brevity I'm going to focus on looking at uh, um, the global south in particular the Gambia I'm looking at the Gambia Africa right now and looking at how the internet uh, due to pseudo health information is affecting the population there whether or not they're rejecting traditional treatments, which more than likely is the case. I've already heard that this is the, this is the case. And I'm just, I just want to look at the impact of that. And so that is a field that I'm somewhat becoming more and more passionate about because it is personal. Someone died as a result of pseudo health information online and uh, it's, it needs to stop. Something needs to be done. And so I'm, I'm going to start looking more into uh, what political uh, aspects I can, I can take on to try to combat this stuff. Um, it just should not be out there. If you're going to claim that uh, mushroom powder can cure a cold, then you better back it up with hardcore data. If you cannot back that up, it is false information. It is pseudo health information, and you should not be able to have that website. Now, some people might be upset about that, and they think, you know, I shouldn't say, they, I mean, they can have the website, but it won't be Googleable. All right. Um, I think that if if companies are out there peddling information that they cannot back up and it could potentially be causing harm, especially, of course, they've been proven to cause harm um, in some way. Why should, why can't we Google these people and buy their products? So, but it's tricky because, and this is what I'm researching and how to do this because, well, the information should be there so you would know what to and what not to do. But the problem is this information is out there to make a buck. And uh, how do you decipher what's what and, and who is going to be in charge of that? Who's going to remove information? How do they determine what information is valid and what's not? Um, is, are we violating freedom of speech now? Um, you know, so there are all these issues to look at, but it, it's challenging, but it is harming a, a lot of people. I wish I didn't have a similar story, but you know, my, my granddaughter went to uh, leukemia and when things got, uh, when things got desperate, I remember, you know, when you, when you start looking for anything, you know, and somebody started right. suggesting a guy here in Texas who had this breakthrough plan that, that you know, that, that was uh, supposedly being uh, pressed by, well, I don't know, big pharma or whatever the, the paranoid thing was. Exactly. And people were recommending that I check out this guy. Well, I did check out this guy, but not in exactly the way that they that they meant. They, they, they meant that I should just go to him and, and have him you know, save her, but that, that wasn't ever going to be possible. That was, that was never an option to, to, he, he, first of all, he wanted you know, thousands of dollars, but also he had a plan that, like you said, you can't find anybody that actually went through this treatment that, right. that, that, that can speak positively about him. Exactly. Uh, he has no science to back him up at all. And then right. coincidentally, 
right as all these people are, are sending me messages that I should go check this guy out, you know, PZ Myers wrote an article about that guy and I was able oh, to wow. just, just respond back in here. Look at this. And of course, then they dismiss that because, you know, what does PZ Myers know? He's only a fish scientist. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. So, why is it that the um, the the accolades of, or or your academic expertise only matter when it supports your argument, and, and not when it doesn't? Yeah, I mean, so this has been so this so because I have again, this this it's, it's personal, and so I'm interested in figuring out the um, you know how widespread this is and what can we do to help. Uh, stop uh, this so abuse. am i am i getting the impression then that you're, you're going to bring back you're going to start your radio show yep. again uh yep. is it going to be the infidel guy again no i can't think of a name yet <laughs> you know I don't, I don't want to be reg and friends um so i i'm i'm having difficulty figuring out what i want to call it i i would like it to be something more uh more marketable something that if i decided to stop doing it myself someone else can just pick up the reins and just move forward, which I've noticed the Young Turks did that okay, which I thought was surprising, because um, I, uh, I was, you know, I'm the infidel guy, and I wondered how would that work. And then I noticed that the Young Turks are doing it, and no one's really questioning it. Do you uh, have to be Turkish to be? A <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I wondered. I was like, because I wondered that before, and I actually appeared on his program, uh, by the way, many years ago, before he even started. Wow, how big is how big they are now? But, um, and we talked about religion then. So I'm not really sure. Maybe the, the listeners out there, any old uh, fans in the, you know, from uh, in the past, or maybe you, new listeners, can give me some ideas about that. I don't really know what. Do you have any idea of about a platform that you're you're going to pursue? I mean, well, um, I'm debating right now between live and archive programs. Uh, I love live because people can call in and give me uh, their feedback right away. I think that in the past that really helped me grow faster because I could hear uh, 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 individuals' critiques of my content in the flesh and I can change my ideas right there on the spot and take the program in, in a completely different direction. Can I suggest um, that you sure. do do interviews with people as I'm doing right now and then uh, have it open to live discussion of what just happened or who you just spoke to and, and then people can can because this is what they always love to do. They always say you shouldn't have said this, you should have said this or this is wrong <laughs> what you said. <laughs> True. True, always. Everybody's really good at that. Yeah, hindsight's 2020, right? And then when you listen to your own program, you hear that too. I mean, sometimes you would hear it, you know, uh, probably quicker than they would sometimes. But uh, but yeah, so that is uh, definitely an interview. But I remember in the past, my listeners said they really loved it when I just ranted, uh, just talked about whatever the issue was of the day and just just hit it hard, whatever whatever it was. Okay. And well, at some point, I don't know if you can get a hold of the equipment to do so before before you get your uh, your studio put together. Yeah. But if you're if it's possible for you to do, I'd like to see you host an episode of Secular Nation. Okay. Well, that that would be awesome. Uh, I'd, I'd be honored. That'd be a wonderful opportunity uh, to engage with your listeners here and with the viewers. So I don't know where else to go with this and keep it interesting. So I guess I'm going to let you off the hook with this. Uh, I'm going to let you uh, give a, a closing statement to to promote yourself, plug whatever you're doing, or tell me whatever else that you wanted to say that you haven't said so far. Okay, well, sure. I mean, again, thank you again for uh, – I'm glad I met you, and thank you for the opportunity for appearing on your program. For those people in the past who remember the Infidel Guy show, again, you can check out infidelguy.com. All those same archived greats are there. All the same programs are there. Um, but also have amazinglife.bio now. That's uh, my – a biology oriented website in which I am really trying to help cater to those fifth graders um, you know and, ab and above and it's not scholarly it's just to get people involved in uh, bi the biological sciences and check out reginaldfinley.com that's where pretty much all my background in it is and uh, you'll find everything else you need to know there LinkedIn Facebook and everything else in between and I'm always looking for good opportunities to appear on, on programs uh, do talks I do hope to eventually, once I start my program, get back into the talk circuit as well and do some traveling. So um, I think that's about it. Okay. Reginald Finley, everybody. Uh, until further notice, the infidel guy. <laughs> uh, so be it. <laughs> <laughs>